Hello, good people. Dr. Lund here. Well, the biggest thing in the news for the past at least month and a half has been the murders of the four Idaho students and the recent arrest of the suspect. And today, the document regarding the probable cause affidavit was released. And here are some of the takeaways that one the surviving roommate did see the suspect in the home and was able to give somewhat of a description. There was a tan leather knife sheath that was found on the bed next to one of the victims. The DNA from the knife sheath is likely from the suspect. And videos show the sedan at the crime scene and at Washington State University, along with some cell phone pinging that looked like the suspect had been surveilling the home at least on 12 episodes prior to the murder. One of the things that looking at the affidavit documentation really highlighted to me that many of the things that were said in the news or on social media were absolutely wrong, uh -huh. such as things like the students were killed in their sleep, that the two roommates that were left alive did not see or hear anything, which makes sense that that statement would be made in attempts, of course, to protect both of the roommates, especially since one did see the suspect, or, well, they saw the murderer, and, of course, you would want to protect these folks, especially while the person was still at large, so that makes sense. Again, from the documentation, some things that really haunt me was the fact that some of these victims were awake when this had happened, especially from the documentation regarding what the one roommate who was not harmed had reported especially hearing that there was a statement said to Zana about telling her that it was going to be okay and that he was going to help her. That's very disturbing in, if, in fact, the murderer had had that conversation with her and then ultimately killed her. That's very, that is very haunting. In addition, the affidavit describes what the one roommate saw as, from the documentation, she described <clears throat> the murderer walking toward her. But it's not specific in that if he saw her, if they made eye contact, and when she talked about freezing um, and going into kind of that sort of mode, um, there's no specific description as far as was she in her room, was she out of her room, when she said he walked by her, did he walk by the room and not notice that she was peeking out of the door? So those things we don't know about. And of course, as many people have talked about, the time frames were different than what was described previously. It sounds like the murders had taken place at a later time, around 4 in the morning to around 4.20 in the morning. I think with the discrepancies, that sort of opens up some questions that a lot of people have talked about is if the roommate 
had seen the murderer leave, let's say, after 4.20 a.m., what was the delay in calling 911? And again, I don't know if we have all accurate information, and I suspect that we don't, and some of that, again, probably was for the protection of the survivors. Regardless, that probably will come out at some point in time, but I think the survivors in that situation probably are having a horrifically traumatic time realizing, one, their friends, their roommates, people that they lived with were murdered, and two, they were present for that and were left spared for whatever reason. That's a very difficult, very difficult scenario to reconcile. There are also a couple of things that really struck me as I was everybody else was sort of watching this unfold. Um, one was during the, the two stops in Indiana as the suspect was driving with his father. Unless I didn't hear it, I did not hear the officer ask for the registration of the car. I heard him ask for his um, ID, his driver's license, but I didn't hear him ask for the registration, nor did I see any movement of them go into where you usually keep it in your glove compartment of the car to pull your registration. And so I, not that I've been stopped a lot in my life, but I have on occasion, once or twice, and they always ask for your license and your registration. And so I just find that kind of odd, and maybe it's not. And maybe it is. The other issue is that people have already pointed out in different videos, but I do find it a very odd response is once he was arrested, it sounds like his one and only statement or question at the time was, has anybody else been arrested? Which... Whether that was a game or whether that was to see if there was validation that other people were involved in this, I just don't think an innocent person would have that response. If, if I was arrested for something I didn't do, I wouldn't be asking if somebody else was arrested as well, as well too. I would be defending myself, um, claiming my innocence, asking for an attorney. That just seemed, that just seemed odd, an odd response. But again, time will tell. At this juncture, there are a couple of things I'm interested to seeing what's going to happen as the process moves moves forward. First of all, are they, his defense, going to ask for a speedy trial, which means that the trial should happen within six months period of time. And this is a capital murder trial, and so that's very little time for preparation, I would imagine, with preparing a case, getting discovery, continuing the investigation. Um, that just seems really quick for something so major with four victims and that much of a crime scene. The other issue that I wonder about being more psych-oriented is the mitigation process usually with a capital murder case, there is somebody who does mitigation on the defense team. And we saw that in the Nicholas Cruz case that they looked for mitigating factors to talk to the jury about things in their past, past abuse, 
um, reasons why this person should not be put to death. And so in order to get that information, the person doing the mitigation research and review has to spend a lot of time with family, uh, understand uh, the suspect's background, um, issues. We know, well, we've heard, we don't know, we have heard from some of the media that he was overweight, he was made fun of, uh, had some issues with drug abuse, supposedly, um, have not heard anything about relationships, basically, and uh, people describing him as as odd, as a somebody with some OCD. We we don't know. We we really don't know an awful lot about him, and that's why again, looking at mitigating factors that would preclude him from being executed, um, to me is a a really important issue and it's something again that usually takes more than six months to be able to develop but again those are some of the issues and some of the thoughts I have going forward I'm not I'm not able to really do much of an analysis of the suspect because at this point in time you know, I've, I've only really seen him under the duress of an arrest, being taken to jail, being taken to court, being flown across the country. Um, I don't have a good sense of his background except for his educational background. And, you know, do I see him as a genius? No. People in PhD programs aren't necessarily a genius. I know I have a PhD. Um... And so, no, I, 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 I don't think that that's something that you're required to have um, for some of the educational degrees that anybody has. But again, personality-wise, relationship with his family, his parents, his sisters, there is so much left that we really don't have a handle on. And so I'm not comfortable at all speculating on what I see him and see his behaviors as at this point in time, except, except, some, except somebody who is under probably much duress because of the situation. So let's just keep our eyes on, on the case. Uh, it's something that you can't avoid um, from both the legal perspective, the psychiatric and psychology perspective, and some of the other factors that will at some point in time come to light. So I thank you all for listening and thank you so much. I gotten so many new subscribers, some wonderful folks, some colleagues in the field. Um, and I'm so happy when, when I see folks come in with similar or different backgrounds. Um, and with no backgrounds in psychology that lend such a great discussion in the comment section. So thank you all, and we'll just keep following this case, and thoughts and prayers to the victims' families.